Um, hi, everybody. My name is Charity Counts. I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Midwest Museums. Thank you for joining us today for the 2022 AMM Groundbreakers Award virtual celebration event. Before I begin today's program, I invite Leslie Wright to offer a land acknowledgement. Hello, I'm in Grinnell, Iowa, and I'm a former AMM board member and a retired art museum director here at Grinnell College. Before our session begins, I would like to invite you all to pause and reflect on the history of the land we each occupy at this moment. Because I'm located in Iowa, I invite you to join me in acknowledging the Meskwaki, Sauk, and Iowa peoples, their elders both past and present, as well as their future generations. I rec wish to recognize the strength and resilience of these and all indigenous peoples who have endured and continue to steward the land that we are privileged to call home. In spite of the devastation, their land and, uh, their land and their lives as a result of colonialism. Through these, th though these people lost their lands formally in, 1940, in 1845, through government land concessions, the Meskwaki in Iowa have reclaimed land and have owned and expanded their settlement since 1857, just 30 miles from where I sit. I honor all my indigenous neighbors past and present. Now I'm gonna return the mic to Charity. Thank you, Leslie. I have a few housekeeping notes be before we begin the program today. First of all, you're welcome to have your video on if you choose, but please keep your audio muted until we prompt you to unmute at different points during the program. Uh, this event is an opportunity for all of us to celebrate our recipient, but also to learn more about them and their work. Please feel free to comment or ask questions in the chat, and we'll get to those as soon as we can during Q&A later. We encourage you to react to what you're hearing today. Uh, reactions can be audible applause, and there will be moments for that uh, during the program, and we'll let you know when it's time. We also encourage the use of reactions tools in the Zoom menu located at the bottom of your screen, where you can offer thumbs up or clap or other responses that you choose uh, without the use of audio. You can also wave or snap your fingers, even though we can't hear you, we can see your response if you have your video on. Finally, we have an ASL interpreter with us today. Uh, you can pin uh, Maura to wherever you need her uh, on your screen if you wanna uh, drag and drop her. I think Zoom allows you to do that, or you can just click add pin if you right click on her video and that'll move her to the top of the screen for you. If you have questions about how to do that, feel free to post them in the chat. Uh, for those of you who are getting to know AMM for the first time today, um, I'd like to provide a little bit of background on our organization and this particular program. Uh, founded in 1927, we are one of the very first museum associations in the United States. We serve an eight state region and our community includes traditional museums and historic sites, as well as art and cultural centers, science centers, zoos and libraries. One of our favorite new programs, which has started during the pandemic, are our virtual awards celebrations. It is a joy for us to be able to celebrate today's recipient and all of our 2022 honorees through events that bring together their peers in the museum community, their staff and colleagues, family and friends. Thank you for those of you who are able to join us today live. Um, and thanks to those who are listening in uh, on the recording later. We're glad you could be here with us today virtually. I'd now like to take a moment to acknowledge our honorees and special guests today. Please wave when I say your names. Uh, Rachel Nicholson, Jocelyn Edens, Kimberly Masteller, Christine Murray, and Glenn North. Uh, you'll learn more about our guests during the program and during their introductions. Um, I don't see, I see some people still joining in. Um, if we have other AMM board members out there, I haven't looked through the whole list yet. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, and I think that's about it for opening remarks. I wanna pass the mic um, back to Leslie now to get the awards presentation started. Great, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. The Groundbreakers Award recognizes museums or cultural organizations who have pushed past boundaries, broken conventions, 
addressed uncomfortable truths about their institution's histories and connection to oppressive systems and structures, or creatively engage collaborative partners to affect change in the pursuit of a better, more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable future. Our goal with this category was to award steps taken, big or small, that have resulted in better support for staff and volunteers, greater service to diverse communities, new thinking about collections, or advancement of social justice, or all of the above. Especially as a former art museum director, I appreciate the intentional approach and vulnerability required by this year's recipient, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art for their A Frame of Mind podcast. A Frame of Mind is a five episode podcast that, in the museum's words, grapples with local stories that have national urgency around race, shared public space, and representation through the lens of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, Missouri. The podcast takes a hard look at the museum's history and present relationship to its citizens. It has been received as a clear signal that the museum is committed to pursuing a future that is more equitable, more inclusive, and more transparent. The AMM selection team was impressed especially by the museum's engagement of many community voices and partners, their willingness to break out of expected modes, and the specific self-reflection on representations of harm long overlooked on the museum's own walls. AMM applauds the inclusive, thoughtful nature of a frame of mind. We were proud to present the Groundbreakers Award to the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art this summer in Milwaukee, and we are very excited to learn more about the project during today's event, including ways it continues to impact the community and internal museum operations. At this point, I invite every one of us today to unmute or use your Zoom reaction icons to join me in a round of applause in honor of this year's Groundbreakers Award recipient, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, its leadership, staff, and community partners. Thank you. Congratulations once again to all of you. I now invite Rachel Nicholson to offer remarks and kick off the program portion of this event. Thank you, Leslie and Charity. Um, on behalf of Nelson Atkins staff, volunteers, community partners, and board, we are honored to receive this award. Um, I'm speaking for myself as well as Ann Manning, our Deputy Director of Learning and Engagement, who unfortunately can't be with us today, but was truly a champion of this project from the very beginning. I am going to try to be brief in my remarks because I will say the real groundbreakers in this room, uh, the visionaries, thinkers, and creatives are Jocelyn, Kim, Christine, and Glenn. Uh, but I do want to highlight how this fits into our museum's journey to become more inclusive, relevant, and welcoming to all of Kansas City. The podcast would certainly not have been possible without years of relationship building, listening and learning, shifting power dynamics, embracing other forms of expertise, building trust, being humble, and stepping aside to create space for other voices and narratives, some of those you hear in the podcast. We highlight some of this work, especially in episode five, but I just wanna underscore the many years of work that our colleagues put in to create an environment where we could bring this project forward. You don't just jump into a podcast like this. Um, the time has to be right. You have to have trust. And for this, for us, this happened through years of exhibitions, programs, and community partnerships. And I think the real work happened uh, for a lot of people over coffee, just deeply listening to our community members and building those relationships. Um, the process of making the podcast was certainly not easy. Institutionally, we tried to let go of authority. I think we did this most of the time. <laughs> um, and it took a lot of conversations to build trust and understanding across the museum. Some of the most transformative moments for me happened during table reads when members of our leadership team um, shared openly and struggled through conversations about race, memory, impact, and intent. We are very lucky that we have a board that was incredibly supportive and ready for this work. 
And I know intimately that this team gave so much thought to all of the nuances um, to make sure that we were guided by courage, humility, and empathy, rather than fear, ego, or indifference. I am humbled to be able to work with Kim and Jocelyn on a daily basis and to have been able to collaborate with Glenn and Christine. We are a better museum because the people who made this podcast and who are on this call are truly exceptional human beings. So I wanna turn it over now to Jocelyn and Kim to present a little bit more about the project. Thank you, Rachel. Um, feeling uh, emotional in a way that I wasn't fully expecting to feel. So I'll blame that on you, Rachel. Uh, maybe a little bit on Anne. Um, <laughs> uh, so I um, wanted to extend so much thanks to Charity and to Leslie and to the Association of Midwest Museums um, for this honor. It's, it's so exciting to see this project recognized. Um, I'm, I'm so deeply personally proud of this project. Um, my name is Jocelyn Edens. I um, work in interpretation at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, um, and I'm here with my colleague Kim Masteller, who's the curator of South and Southeast Asian art. Um, and we've been on this um, fun audio journey for um, many years now. Some, somehow it's been many years. Um, so the, the project that we're calling a frame of mind changed a lot over time by design. It was designed to be responsive to um, uh, really be engaged in, in deep listening and, and therefore change from sort of an, an original starting point to what you hear in the podcast. Um, but one of the things we knew from the beginning was that we wanted to explore the Nelson Atkins relationship to Kansas City um, and to our own history as a museum through the perspectives and experiences of our community members. Um, so if the project is breaking any grounds, it's, um, I'm going to disagree with Rachel and Anne here, if, if, it's, <laughs> if it's breaking any ground, it's really because of the honesty and generosity of our partners and our colleagues. Um, so it's it's really been an honor to learn from our partners, um, especially from Glenn North and Christine Murray, who you'll hear from um, in a few minutes, um, but I'll pass it off to, to Kim to share more. Thank you, Jocelyn, and um, thank you, Rachel. That was a really touching um, introduction. And I want to throw some of that love and appreciation back to you, who was very involved with us as well. Um, and thanks to AMM for your appreciation and recognition. It really means a lot to me. Um, uh, I'm a curator. Uh, and working on this podcast with Jocelyn Glenn and Christine has been an amazing experience. It's one of the mo my most proud uh, experiences uh, here since I've joined the Nelson Atkins uh, Museum of Art. Um, and as a curator, our role is usually to research, to determine, and to tell a story that then gets presented in the galleries or in exhibitions. Um, and traditionally, the curator and their museum team control that story. And so this project was unlike any I'd ever participated in before. Um, it was essential not to be the storyteller, but to be an empathetic listener, a facilitator, and a champion for other voices and perspectives, even if some of what they had to say was hard to hear. Um, we worked with approximately 40 partners to create a frame of mind, 17 of whom uh, you hear in the final audio. Uh, and so instead of listening to me, I would really like to take a few minutes uh, to thank and honor the voices that you heard. Um, so our participants, beginning with our host, Glenn North, then Dee Barker, Wanda Battle, Alvin Brooks, Congressman Emmanuel Cleaver II, Mona Cliff, Lucky Garcia, Justin E. Karyonwu, Alex Kimball Williams, Munfua Lewis, Krishan McKinney, Chaluba Musanda, Mukeda Peterson, Sony Ruffin, Alex Pontius Stock, Eric Stafford, Angel Tucker, and Jacob Wagner. Uh, also, uh, some more of our collaborators, our team producer, Dua Muhammad, um, our um, in house. Um, uh, uh, team, which I'll get to in a minute, but let me also talk about our advisory group, uh, which included Jimmy Beeson II, Jose Faust, Alan Gray, Ron Jones, India Richardson, 
And then um, the wonderful musical and artistic support we had uh, with our theme music by the Black Creatures and our cover art by Michelle and Angie Dreyer at Two Tone Press. Uh, and then finally, there were a lot of people on the inside that worked with us. So just quickly, some of our lead people, Rachel Nicholson, uh, Linda Battle, Tara Laver, our archivist, Tim Hart, Brent Ballou, and our very own director, Julian Sukozikoitia. Um, so hearty thanks to all of, the, all of these people and friends and partners. And um, now let's hear a little bit from them. I'll give it back to Jocelyn. Thanks, Kim. Um, listening to you say all the names of our partners made me remember a conversation that we had, uh, probably many conversations that we had about the power of names and naming and remembering names. And um, it just feels really important to hear all of the names of, or at least some of the names. I'm sure that there are names that we didn't say out loud, but it feels important to, to say them in this space. Um, so if you, if you haven't listened to A Frame of Mind or if it's been a while, we wanted to play a bit of the audio. Um, and, and bring that into the space as well. So um, this is the first act of the first episode, which lays out what we tried to do in this podcast. Um, you'll hear um, a Black Lives Matter protest about a block away from the museum. You'll hear the voice of Glenn North, and you will hear theme music by the Black Creatures. May 30th, 2020, Kansas City, my hometown. <laughs> Everybody, we don't need spectators. We need y'all to join or leave. Those are powerful words said through a bullhorn at a Black Lives Matter march that went right by the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. My name is Glenn Nord. I'm a poet, a spoken word artist, and maybe most importantly, a Black man. Born and raised in this place. There's America to the East, America to the West, and here we are smack dab in the middle, a racially divided city at the crossroads of a racially divided country. The way I see it, you can't talk about anything in our country, museums, barbecue, football, whatever, without talking about race. Even choosing not to talk about it, you're talking about it. So I get what that guy meant in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in the middle of trying to make change, anybody standing on the sidelines is not helping. Spectating is not doing the work. But I've been thinking a lot about this, especially because I do a lot of work in museums. When you go to a museum, spectating is the main activity, right? You look around, you find something that catches your eye. You look deeper. There's a lot of power in that act. One of the most important things a poet like me does is look, observe, and pick up on details other people might not see. A lot of people are having conversations right now about how to be more than a spectator. The Nelson Atkins is trying to do that work too. As a museum, as a symbol of Kansas City, they are taking a long, hard look at themselves. So this is the part where I say, welcome to A Frame of Mind, the podcast of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. I have the honor of being your host, and I don't take that responsibility lightly. Feeling welcome is a complicated subject. More on that later. I personally have a somewhat complicated backstory with the Nelson Atkins, but for now, let me just say, that this podcast is one part of an overall effort to confront the past and chart a course for the future. Now, do I believe a podcast will, as one of my colleagues put it, fix racism? No, I don't. What I hope is that this podcast, however flawed it may be, will be a step in the right direction. I can't think of a better place to have this conversation than a nationally recognized museum in the middle of the United States, in the middle of my hometown. So we're going to talk to a lot of people in the community over the course of this podcast. Because sometimes to really see ourselves, we have to start with what others see. 
So as much as I'd love to have a 90 minute listening party with you all, um, we'll <laughs> call that a day on, on the audio from the podcast, but I um, just wanted to bring in the room some of the other themes of the, of the full arc of the season. Um, so I think we were really hoping that the stories would be specific to the Nelson Atkins and to Kansas City, um, but also relevant and familiar um, to any city, any museum in the US. Um, and so they might be a sort of point of inspiration, inspiration for others working in, in different contexts. Um, so the themes that emerge from conversations and interviews um, include urban planning and segregation, settler colonialism, representation and feelings of belonging or disbelonging, the zone between appropriation and celebration, um, and the idea that while no one knows what's in store for the future of museums, looking to the past can help us move forward wisely. Um, so I'll pass to Christine Murray, the producer of A Frame of Mind, who helped us navigate those themes um, and elevate the stories we heard in interviews with our partners. Hi, everybody. I don't want to talk for very long, but I would say one thing that if you haven't listened to the podcast, it sounds way better than that. Um, <laughs> because Zoom is not the greatest listening environment. So just as an audio person, I had to, the 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 Black Creatures music is so amazing and it didn't really come through. Um, and some of the environmental and ambient sounds that are mixed in with that wonderful um, um, narration by Glenn, just, it sounds better if you listen in headphones, just, okay, enough of that. Um, and, and, and as I was just listening to that, because I haven't, you know, listen to it in a while. I lived with it in my head and in my house and in my computer and in my life for many years, but I, you know, I haven't listened to the completed piece in a while. And it's, what's really interesting to me is that, you know, we as a team met every Friday for two years, I would say, like, I don't know, those, those teen workshops that we started with were in like November of 2020. Um, so many of the conversations that we were having amongst ourselves when we were actually grappling with how you talk about this stuff actually ended up there in the like I can I remember the conversation when we were talking about I found that clip from the Black Lives Matter march and I was like I found the opening this is the moment this guy with this bullhorn says you know spectating is not doing the work and we all had a conversation about that. And at some point, I remember Jocelyn said, but isn't spectating like what you do in a museum? Like maybe we can make something out of that. And then, and then, you know, we had this long conversation about looking, like the difference between looking and seeing and, and the difference between like really having an intentional conversation about that and just using that as a metaphor. And so it's just, it was just, like that's just an observation I made in listening to that like I heard so much of like doing the authentic work internally kind of ended up in this creative um expression so that's one thing I wanted to just say because that just came up um I wanted to give a shout out to the teen council that when we were talking uh earlier about all the people that were involved part of what um part of where we started, which was a long, long time ago, was with doing a series of workshops with the Nelson Atkins Teen Council. And those were some of the smartest, most engaged, like most visionary, really mature, um, challenging, just great people. And, you know, I was sort of doing all these, how you make a podcast workshop and at some point, because they were all going to help with um, with either sculpting questions or connecting us with people to talk to or participating in the interviews themselves. And um, at some point we made a in in one of our teen council um, presentation or workshops that we did, we made a kind of vision map of how the process was going to work, how you make a participatory podcast, which was something that was ground that not a lot of people were, I don't know, there wasn't a, there wasn't any kind of roadmap for this. And we really wanted this to be super uh, iterative and sort of circular. And what we were hearing from the community was going to inform the narrative. And then we were going to pursue that. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's kind of, as you can see, a little bit insane. Um, like if you look at that, you're like what is going on? And it actually, I just want to say, like, it worked. Like, this crazy map 
of call and response and listening and create and creation really worked. And so I just um those early conversations with those with the teen council really helped us articulate and think through this kind of and embrace kind of messiness in the process because we really wanted to go someplace new and we didn't know how to get there except to just feel our way along. And so the best, um, I would just say the best person in the universe to guide anybody in that process is my partner right over there, Glenn North. So I'm going to big shout out to you, Mr. North. So now you have to go off of mute and talk to us. <laughs> thank you all so much. I want to thank the uh, Association of Midwest Museums for this honor. I want to thank the Nelson for giving me this opportunity. And I feel like um, there's so many things that I want to share, but I'll just start off by saying that I'd worked with the Nelson before. And if you listen to the podcast without uh, giving too much away, um, prior to the staff that is assembled now, uh, there was a different group of people um, that I had to work with at the Nelson. And there were some kind of unspoken, what I interpreted to be and really felt in my spirit were, were issues of race and, and my competence. Uh, the first time I did a project with the Nelson was a poetry uh, writing workshop where the participants would be writing poems in response to the artwork um, at the Nelson. And uh, my credentials were questioned. My pedigree was questioned. I had to have a lot of the work reviewed before I was able to, to present. And so I just felt, um, I did not feel welcome at first, uh, but that workshop went well and I continued to work with the Nelson. And so um, I noticed that when Julian came in and, and uh, the, the folks that you see assembled here, um, there was just a change in the way the Nelson was engaging with the community. So when um, we first met and Kim and Josh were talking to me about this idea for a podcast, um, kind of just started out with a conversation about what my thoughts were. Um, and as the conversation continued, um, I was then asked to, to host and uh, as I said, I did not take that lightly because even though I had felt that changes were taking place, I didn't want to be put in the position of being a PR person for the Nelson. I didn't want to participate in anything that would be surface and performative. And so um, I made that clear from the very beginning. And what transpired is that the Nelson was very authentic. Uh, they, uh, we, we had some very, uh, difficult and complex conversations at table reads. Um, and there were times where um, there was some pushback, but, um, you know, all of the, the decisions that we made and certain things that we thought might not be able to uh, be a part of the podcast were ultimately approved. And I feel very um, good about uh, the product and, and what it can mean to people who who um, are inspired and who want to try to do things to move towards social justice. Um, I also wanted to say that um, during the time that we were having all these conversations after the murder of George Floyd, there were so many white people that were um, open with me about feeling fearful of saying the wrong thing and not wanting to put their foot in their mouth and you know, just really feeling uncomfortable because they didn't want to actually do more harm. And I would get frustrated because, you know, I've had to talk about race my whole life. And, you know, I would um, kind of think that that was a privileged perspective. That is until we decided uh, that we were going to do episode three that uh, spoke to the Keck reliefs, which um, are on the upper exterior of the Nelson. And there are these really, um, negative uh, stereotypical representations of uh, American Indians versus colon, um, you know, uh, the colonists and the colonists are painted in this really, you know, courageous light and um, the Native Americans and the American Indians are depicted as, as savage and violent. And um, so when we decided that we would have American Indian uh, people from that community speaking, 
I was like, oh, I'm so nervous. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't know what language to use. Even now, I've said American Indian. I think I've said First Nation. I think I've said Native American. I didn't know if it was okay to use the word tribe or not. And just depending on who you talk to, um, it varies. But um, I was um, having to, to, to relate to um, that experience of not wanting to say the wrong thing, not wanting to do more harm, and having to confront my own insecurities around that. And so that was a very humbling experience for me, but I learned so much. And as Jocelyn and Rachel and Kim and Christina iterated, it just became very important for me to listen. Um, and, you know, I would just say um, there is no blueprint for this. It is very messy, even when you try to map it out as that chart just demonstrated, but you just, you have to start somewhere. And, and we knew, and we were very open in the beginning that this might be a flawed attempt. We're not necessarily saying that we have it figured out, but you just have to start somewhere and you have to be willing to make mistakes. You have to be willing uh, to, to accept correction when necessary. And that is the only way the conversation will move forward. Awesome. Uh, you know who to pass the mic to now. Well, I'm gonna, I'll be here. <laughs> I, first, I just want to say, let's unmute one more time and uh, congratulate all of you. It's just been so much fun to just listen to you talk about this and reconnect <laughs> during this uh, event so far. So please join me by unmuting and clap and cheer loudly. Or <laughs> 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 um, so at this part of the program, I've got some questions I want to ask you all, uh, and then we also welcome others who are here uh, to drop questions in the chat. There's something that you thought of that you uh, have always wanted to know about the project, if you're familiar with it already, or um, that you think would be fun to ask this group, or that make you curious if you didn't know much about this uh, project until today. Um, but I'm going to get us started with a question that kind of takes you back to the beginning. Um, <laughs> How did you initiate the conversations with your collaborators? And I'm gonna point this towards the team from Nelson Atkins first. Um, and I know that you've talked a bit about the relationship building that happened in the years prior, but even with that, when you're bringing this type of project, and I know it's evolved, right? Um, to your community members, how are you pitching that? Or how do you, pull that into the conversations you were already having. Kim, kick us off and then Kim and Rachel. Um, and then. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, that, that, that was, a ch that's a challenge, right? Because even um, if we have this idea that we want to authentically hear other people's histories of our museum, how do we, from this this place ask, right? And so I think it's a lot about um, uh, not only working with people you had relationships with, but building a group of advisors uh, and partners who also have deep relationships with who can help you find people that that you've never connected with or help you have difficult conversations um, because I don't think any of these conversations could happen without some kind of trust um, or willingness to extend trust. Um, to say some very, sometimes uh, very personal things. So um, I, I guess uh, that's kind of a big picture view, but I'll, I'll hand off to Jocelyn to talk more about this. Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, you know, I think the ask and the approach to Glenn was maybe the the biggest and most important approach um, because I think the host, um, that that role is really the glue that held everything together that if a listener can trust the host to, to tell these stories um, or to listen to these stories, then that's the success of the podcast. And so I think all of the props to Glenn as someone who is deeply trustworthy and you can hear that in your voice, Glenn, I think, um, which is convenient for an audio medium. Um, and, and so I think often the approach was um, uh, sort of here, here's what we think that we're doing. 
Um, but we, what we think we're doing is also very open to change. And so it can change in this conversation that we're having right now, I think was the consistent um, move with Glenn. And then I think also with interviewees um, or with, with advisory group members, um, I hope anyway. So I think um, to ask someone to participate in something that's completely amorphous is a bit unfair, I think. Um, and so I think we always had to have some kind of structure, some kind of ask, some kind of sort of thematic um, anchor or, or engine. Um, but that it, it was sort of always open to change through conversation, I think was crucial. And whenever possible, we tried to have a meeting prior to the interview, not to necessarily coach anybody or to try to coax anybody to say certain things, but to just test the waters to find out, you know, what the conversation might look like and so that people wouldn't feel that once the interview was actually taking place that they would get caught off guard or um, that we had you know some other agenda than than what as jocelyn said we presented what we thought we were trying to do and we were so welcome and you know we welcomed you know the opinion of others and and it really i'm so glad that we did that because it that's what led us. I think if we had said, this is what we want to do, and this is how this five episode arc is going to be, we would have had to try to force conversations, ask leading questions, and that would not have gotten us to where we needed to go. But by just trusting that the community would, would give us the signals in terms of direction, I think that was the wisest thing we could have done because the the that organic kind of approach led us to where we needed to be. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say one thing, which is that we made this entire podcast during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I'm a documentary filmmaker and an audio producer. And like my number one advice to anybody giving an interview is be in the room with the other person, establish a personal connection, look them in the eye, be a human being talking to another human being. That's how an interview really sings you know that's 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 what it's all about and this moment that we were grappling with was like you know the zoom moment and there was a way that i learned as a as a media maker that actually there was something about i mean that moment we were all trying to connect through the computer anyway but that it made interviews more convenient for many of our interviewees. We, we didn't ask people to drive, you know, or get themselves to a sound studio, or we didn't show up with a whole bunch of equipment that was really intimidating. It was just me and Glenn in a Zoom, you know, Glenn having a conversation with somebody on the other end and just, you know, recording it the best that we could. And like all credit to Glenn, who really was able to create deep connections with people in those conversations through the through the Zoomiverse. But I learned just that that one thing, which was like this actually made it in some sense easier for people to participate, for us to have a participatory um, process that um, might might not have worked as well if we had insisted on showing up every place in person. So that's just. Interesting. Kim, are you wanting to add something uh, to that or no? Uh, no, I think you, that okay. was beautiful. Thank you. Well, I want to go back to something you said, Glenn, um, because I was wondering about it already. How do you, how did you or the team put uh, community members at ease? You know, you already described this was, I mean, obviously uh, uh, being open to their thoughts and suggestions was part of this process, but how did, I mean, really putting something at ease isn't always that's <laughs> simply just that, right? Um, what do you think was the sort of, how would you describe the approach? Well, I tried to um, be open about my experiences. Um, so I tried to be vulnerable. Uh, when we had episode three and we were talking about the Keck reliefs with, um, you know, the American Indian community, I was very honest about, I don't know how you like to be referred to. I don't know um, what topics might be particularly sensitive. And so I would just ask you to help me uh, work with you to figure that out. 
and um, I always um, am, am very interested in, you know, I say that, you know, being a black person <laughs> does, I think, just generate a certain level of empathy. You know what it like feels like not to be welcome. You know what it feels like uh, to be misrepresented. You know what it feels like sometimes to feel erased or invisible. So I think my lived experience uh, contributed to the comfort level of some of the people that we had the conversations with. Um, and I don't know how you how you teach that, but I think what you ultimately have to practice is demonstrating vulnerability um, so that people feel more comfortable um, letting their guard down. I think that's a great, great point. And not just demonstrating vulnerability, but truly genuinely feeling that vulnerable, right? It's not just about saying it. Um, so there's a question in the chat here. I don't know who the best person will be to answer this, but I'm gonna read it out loud. What were some of the inflection points when you had to pause and change direction and what provoked those disruptions? Hmm. Well, I can jump in and say, I think what provoked disruptions often, frankly, was, um, was internal um, conversations. Um, and I will leave it to the team to talk about uh, what that felt like to pause and shift, but I think, um, in the same, actually, uh, you know, Glenn, you said we weren't trying to coach community members when we spoke to them. I'll say from the internal side, I think I would have meetings with um, internal leadership and other people who, frankly, I think we were trying to coach. I think we were trying to bring them along um, mm -hmm. because this team was all on board to say, yeah, let's listen, let's listen authentically, let's not put a story onto this, let's hear it and respond and put voices forward. Um, and to be transparent, that's a really scary thing for a large museum. And I think it was really scary for a lot of people inside the museum. And so we needed to uh, bring people along with us. Um, there's a post-it I have actually above my desk that says move at the speed of trust. And it came out of this project wow. um, because it was that idea of like, sure, we can just push this forward, but then you're not actually gonna get the product you want or get the change or get the meaningful conversation. So um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say the things that made this <laughs> group <laughs> pause and take two years and change was um, internal folks in the museum needing more time, more conversation. Um, and again, just to be brought along on the journey in the most generous way possible, because it is scary. And so we needed to be aware that it was scary um, and, and help people be okay with this project. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just say too that, you know, um, in order to get a big project, those of you who work in museums here or others know, you know, you've got a proposal, right? And so the proposal has to say something about what you're going to do, right? What exactly is this going to cover? And we hadn't, we, you know, we just, you know, we're, we're involving, you know, uh, Glenn and uh, Christine, we were, um, and we were having to explain, well, this is exactly what you're going to get for your investment of time and, you know, staff. And um, and so it uh, so you're writing kind of like possible scripts. This might be about this. But so you've got uh, internal, you know, staff. OK, we can get behind this. But then you interview up to 40 people and you find out that's not what they want to talk about at all. And that's yeah. not what affects them. And that's not what they care about. And so to me, those were the inflection points. Every time the project, you know, it's like writing a grant proposal before you've done the project yet. Um, it, it's uh, every time that um, more people contributed and more ideas were raised and they took us in different directions, then it's like letting people know, okay, well, you think it's about this, but what if it's kind of also about that? And um, and so I, I have to give credit though, because that might have taken, it might have made the process longer, but it made us maybe more thoughtful. And as we move through time, from after the the killing of George Floyd and had 
more time and more time with the different people we interviewed and talked with, I mean, I think the countries and people's feelings evolved over time too. And we might've in, ended up having more time to think about and um, this uh, uh, even a stronger um, project with more to say. There was a, an event um, that is described in the podcast that the Nelson hosted. And there was some tension around that event when the Nelson initially wanted to do it in the community. And the interviews with different people who were around at the time, um, there was there were different stories. You know, memory can be amorphous. It 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 it's can be gossamer, you know, and so one person's way of remembering versus somebody else's way of remembering, um, it became a little contentious at, at one point, I think. Uh, and I felt that it was an opportunity to talk about like what that can feel like in a broader sense when, when you don't feel that your story is being shared accurately as we often do as black people and you know, people of color and other disenfranchised groups. And so what I always appreciated, although I would really be like, oh, hell, I have to say something. I really would rather just go get a burger. Um, but it, it, it helped me to be more courageous and confronting. And it was very inspiring to see people um, receptive and 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 for people to listen when when it's hard to hear and you really feel like in a certain situation um, you've been wronged and so like one of my favorite parts of the podcast is in um, the last episode where we talk about um, when um, white people uh, in particular want to present themselves or want to become allies that because there's been so much distrust that your first attempt might not be accepted or your second or third attempt might not be accepted, um, that your intentions may be misinterpreted by the very people that you're trying to help. Uh, but, but if you're serious about it, those are things that you have to kind of push through <laughs> if, if you're serious about the work. Um, you know, just because you're well-intentioned doesn't always mean that that is going to be received the way that you want it to be, or that you're going to necessarily get celebrated or get credit for. And unfortunately, that that comes with the territory if you're serious about the long game of this thing. Yeah, I, I was going to say there were a couple of moments these are sort of as in the construction of the podcast and the writing there were a couple of moments that were less about that maybe and more about just like as storytellers is what we're doing actually working <laughs> is it landing can you follow how many right. freaking people are in this podcast <laughs> um, is it adding up you know and so as we were working through some of the episodes like for example the the episode about the kick reliefs that glenn was talking about um the first pass of that episode was structured entirely differently. And it really was a kind of a, a, a more almost like a panel uh, discussion amongst these three Native women that we had interviewed and Glenn. And it felt very different than the first two episodes that we had already constructed and, and had um, been approved. And, and we went in with this great uh, sort of concept at the table read, which was, we don't speak for Native people. Let the, like, let's just get out of the way and let them speak for themselves. And so the episode was really just Glenn asking a question here, a question there, and mostly these women talking. And it was great. It was a great episode. It was a great podcast episode, but it didn't feel related at all to the rest of the podcast that we had made because we had created this expectation of this narrative journey that you go on with an arc and Glenn as your sort of guide and Glenn as a person who is sharing observations and sort of um, how as the storyteller helping you process this information that you're receiving. So we had to so basically, like we did this table read, we went in, with this, you know, happy and excited and like it just really fell flat. And 
yeah, it was a moment of like, oh, what is, and it took a little while and some conversations to, to identify what it was that wasn't working about it. And somebody in the room, and I don't remember who it was, but I think it was one of the people that wasn't part of our core team, but someone, one of the larger team that was going to those table reads said, I feel like I was reading, a oh, Tony, she said, I feel like I was reading this book, this great novel. And then I like went to the next chapter and it's some other book. It's just not the same book. I'm not reading the same book anymore. And that kind of really broke it for us. And we realized, oh, structurally, we have to change this up. And so that was like, that was a moment where, I mean, I worked really damn hard on that episode <laughs> that just got, was like, eh, do over, you know? Yeah. So that wasn't so much about this, the difficulty of subject matter and more about structure, but it, that was an, that was definitely a moment where a lot of work went into something and then we had to pivot and, and, and redo it. So Christine, you mentioned the table reads and you have all mentioned this so many times now, but I just have to know about these table reads because what I picture a table read looking like is like the, you know, the photos of all the cast of Game of Thrones, you know, staring at a script and processing what's about to happen. But it sounds like these were conversations that were sharing and it sort of was organic and not just, you know, a script that you were reading. So Fill me in. <laughs> what what were these all about? Well, it was you know to be honest with you, um, I think Rachel uh, alluded to it. Um, for the Nelson to to take this risk, there was also um, an attempt, I think, to to make sure that we just didn't go too far afield. You know what I mean? Let's not burn the house down. You know, and so. <laughs> um, so the table read was an opportunity for us to to just you know number one to see if if as Christine had said if the if the narrative was working if we if 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 it felt like it was engaging uh, in the way that we had hoped but to also kind of you know uh, kind of the checks and balances to make sure um, that we. Um, you know, as I said, just weren't going too far off the rails. And so when there was a sense of that, um, that's when the conversations became very um, difficult, but but also I think the most engaging um, when, when there was some disagreement about whether or not this particular story or this particular um, interview um, or what have you, you know, should be included in the podcast, if there was some resistance. Um, or if there were things that that you know we really felt were important to to include, and there was you know the the folks at at the table read or you know who were helping make the decisions, um, you know weren't necessarily on board for all of that. But but to be honest with you, I, every time Christine and I go in there, I'd have a sweat ring like this because it is kind of intense. Um, and and to be honest with you, more often than not. Um, things went really well, and we were able to to all kind of collectively feel good about the way uh, things were going. But there were a couple of times where it did get tense, but I think those are the moments where we learn the most. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm just paying attention to the time. We've got five minutes left in our event. I'm going to ask a relatively simple uh, question for Jocelyn, and then I have a group question before we wrap up today. Um, so Jocelyn, um, you know, the podcast is done. Uh, it doesn't have a life beyond this project um, that you want to share. <laughs> yeah, I think there, there are a few answers to the question. Um, I think one version of the life beyond the project is um, the way that some of the strategies of the podcast are sort of finding their way into other corners of museum projects. Um, so I'll shout out um, Bonnie Thomas is on the call who led a workshop for teachers who are interested in podcasting with their students or encouraging their students to podcast, which is incredible. Um, I think uh, Linda Battle is also on the call who um, was, was we interviewed for the podcast, but also works a lot with programming. And I think thinking about storytelling and programs is something that's sort of filtering into programs here. Um, I think um, sort of big, bigger picture conversations about sort of our capacity for risk taking. I think that's um, sort of, we, we have more of it. Also, I, I think on a, on a general basis, um, not every day, but most days, I think. 
Um, and then I'll say uh, we are starting to dream up a season two, um, but um, I think it's again, a long process. And I think we're, it's the kind of thing where we're gonna figure it out with a lot of different people. So um, I don't know, stay tuned 2024, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing. All right, my my question for everybody. Um, well, whoever wants to answer this, uh, if you could offer one piece of advice to uh, other museums in the Midwest or beyond who find themselves in a similar situation or with similar desires um, to learn and connect and grow and change and make a difference, um, or who are thinking about a similar type of project. What piece of advice would you offer? Think on that for a moment. And then just, you know, let me know if you want to go first. <laughs> well, I, I shared my move at the speed of trust, which I do think is just incredibly important for projects like this. But I will also share something that Jocelyn and I talk a lot about in our work, which is I think sometimes as museum professionals, um, we want everything to be perfect and we want to have the perfect roadmap before we start a project. Um, and I will say that in the time of COVID, our team kicked off a few projects, which frankly, we did not really have a roadmap for. Um, and I think that they are better projects for that. Um, so I would say rather than doing the museum professional thing and trying to figure out every single detail and seeing the risks, you know, miles ahead and planning for those, um, just starting, you know, like action is better than nothing often if it is thoughtful action, if it is generous action. So um, I would say not getting so hung up on the perfect roadmap is really important. And I know it was frustrating. God bless Glenn and Christine who stuck with us through this. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> they probably would have loved a roadmap, but it, I think it made a better project for us. And, and really quickly, I just want to pick up uh, off the, the, the idea of trust, you know, um, with the current political climate, with what's going on with the economy, with what's going on with race relations, um, people don't trust our institutions in the way that they once did, but people still trust museums. Studies have shown that people still generally trust museums and so that's a huge responsibility but i think what made this successful is that the nelson trusted the community that it is in and so i think when you are deciding on what the work is that community engagement piece is is really critical and trust that although you're the museum expert there are people in your community that have ideas and resources and expertise that can really help you move in a direction that is mutually beneficial yeah, thanks, Glenn. Good advice. Christine, Tim, Jocelyn? Uh, I would say I have a couple of a couple of thoughts and they're all kind of colliding, but this work takes time. I think that would be as as like I don't we couldn't have made this podcast with the with the depth and the and the and the feeling that it has if we had made it in six months you know it it just it was deeply considered and if you want to actually make something that's truly collaborative participatory and not performative you have to actually give yourself the time because building trust takes time inside you know getting approvals takes time <laughs> lining people up takes time like i just think don't be don't be fooled you can't make a podcast in six weeks it just it doesn't work that way um yeah. i would just add uh don't be afraid um, because the topics, which might be the hardest, and I'm thinking, you know, from an institutional standpoint, the ones, the places you don't want to go are probably where your audiences or, or your community members or even the people who already love you. Those are the questions and the issues that they have. And if you can find a way to have a dialogue where you can come together on some of those things, even the hard things, um, I, I think it's worth it. Jocelyn, anything to add before we wrap up? 
Yeah, I think um, maybe start with an idea and a, and a purpose and not with the idea of a podcast. Um, <laughs> so I, I think um, we landed on, on podcasts as the medium for a lot of really good reasons, um, but not every project that's interested in grappling with difficult questions or the history of an, of an institution or um, sort of interested in, in thinking about the future of an institution that may not be a podcast for you. Great advice. Well, thank you for sharing everything with us today. This has been extremely insightful and interesting to me. I know many museum people will be listening to this later, and those who were able to join us today have learned a lot. Um, I want to ask everybody just one more time, round of applause. Uh, congratulations. This is so great. Uh, we're so glad to have you in our network and among our friends. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and then, um, you know, we're, we are at time, it's, it's time to wrap up. I um, just want to say, for those who joined us, I hope to see you at our December 1st, our final awards event uh, for the um, Promising Leadership Award winner. Um, but, and I also ask that our recipients uh, and representatives stay on uh, after the end of this for a quick photo op uh, in Zoom here. Um, but thanks again for coming. Thanks for sharing um, and giving us sort of a peek, peek behind, the, behind the podcast here today. Uh, I wish you all the best of luck. And thanks everybody for coming and have a great rest of your week and weekend. Thanks, Charity. Congratulations. Thank you, Maura. Thank you.